Hi, good morning. Thank you all so much for coming. It is so exciting to be here. I'm Jane Thier. I'm a future work reporter at Fortune Magazine, and I'm so thrilled to be in conversation with the wonderful Annie Dean, who is the head of Atlassian's Team Anywhere. We'll get into exactly what that means and what she does. Uh, the conversation today is going to be pretty much focused on the future of work, a uh, very broad topic, but we're really looking forward to digging into it. Annie's the best of the best, so we have a lot of good stuff in store. Um, so as it pertains to remote work, uh, distributed work, flexible work, uh, just the parameters therein and how different Different companies have been approaching it. Annie's been doing this work and studying the outcomes for over a decade. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Annie and just ask if you could tell us a little bit about what brought you to the work that you do uh, in the first place. Totally. Thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, so it's interesting, uh, the conversation around flexibility and remote work has obviously really accelerated over the past three to four years because of the pandemic. Um, but I started getting really interested in this work back in 2015 um, because I was a corporate attorney working on Wall Street. I was a transactional lawyer um, that kept me at the office until four o'clock in the morning on a regular basis. And we would do two o'clock, 2 a.m. pizza orders to stay awake. And um, I had kids kind of early in my career. So I was at that point in my career where I was the person who had to be at the office overnight. You know, I didn't have the autonomy to really um, design my workflows and days in a way that would support what I was experiencing at home, which was having an infant, breastfeeding, and all those things. Um, and it was a really arresting experience for me because I, um, you know, I was like thrust into this change and it was extremely painful, and my career had always been my identity and the most important thing in my life, and I felt like I actually couldn't do these things well. This is a common story, right? Um, but I guess what was different is that I started to recognize that the way I was suffering was not really just about me, and I started to get really curious about what my suffering meant at a massive scale. Because I also knew myself to be somebody who didn't suffer very uh, frequently. You know, I was somebody who could withstand a lot. And I knew if I was in this degree of pain that many other people were, were as well. So at the time, I got really interested in the conversation around the macroeconomic impact of um, work and how it was specifically impacting women and caregiving um, and, and how the structure of work didn't make sense. Because I knew I didn't need to be at the office at 4 o'clock in the morning just to receive the documents by email that were coming in from overseas. Um, and so I started to kind of like literally physically, you know, open a filing desk, which is so antiquated to think about. But I would like open my filing cabinet and I had a, a physical folder that I like labeled work. And I started studying and looking at the data to see what I could learn and pick at. Um, to understand the structure of work and how it was impacting our society. And at the time, there wasn't a big conversation around this. There was lean in, which was kind of saying, hey, you know, yes, it's very hard, but keep working harder until you kind of fall over. And then there was also Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was talking about why women still can't have it all. And she was really talking about this societal conundrum that we were facing. Um, so I started to get really interested in it, and two years went by, um, I ended up having another son, and at that time I was just like, you know what, I've got to go solve this problem, I'm obsessed with it. Um, and so I left corporate law and founded a startup, and that startup tried to figure out how we could introduce flexibility um, as a norm in the corporate environment. And it was interesting because we started that startup as a job board. We were like, we're going to be the LinkedIn of flexible jobs, and everybody's going to be obsessed because everyone wants a flexible job, and that's what our research showed. Um, but we would work with these companies, and they actually couldn't articulate what flexibility meant. There was no common definition of it. And so we found that they weren't able to... Uh, because they weren't able to articulate it, they weren't able to socialize it, they weren't able to create a consistency, consistent policy for it, and they certainly weren't able to give this startup you know, jobs that we could then digitally basically advertise out into the world. Um, and so we pivoted into a data and analytics company. And we realized that we needed to move further back in the journey to educate executives about what we were really talking about. And um, what we did is we measured employee friction across care caregiving, commuting, well-being, and a couple of other factors. 
And then we used an algorithm to say, hey, you know, if you, this type of friction is really present in your workforce, if you let people occasionally work from home, you would have massively less friction mm -hmm. and really positive employee outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it was wild. You know, we, when we, at that time, this is like 2016, what people really wanted was the ability to sometimes work from home and the ability to go to the doctor in the middle of the day. And that was not the norm at the time. We had to sit down with executives and really convince them that that was a worthwhile thing to offer people. And, um, and yet it was very clear even at that time that we would, you know, that that would have massive benefit to the company in a pretty measurable way. And so then, you know, fast forward, that company got acquired in January 2020. And I was like, you know what? I'm not sure I'm going to keep doing this work because I don't think that people get it. And so we, um, we sat, we, we looked at the future, you know, we would sit as a team in my startup and we would say, wow, the future of work is so disruptable. It's so obvious that technology can make work happen in a totally different way and all the problems that we're seeking to solve are 1,000% resolvable. Um, but there's no incentive for businesses to take that risk. One, because they don't understand it, and two, they don't understand what value it's go is going to accrue to them. And so we really thought about it, and we were like, but what, what would make it possible for them to get their hands around this and see the value in the business opportunity? And we had two thoughts. We thought, well, maybe it's a major financial downturn, and people get really interested in treating their real estate differently. Um, but we were like, Ugh, leasing is a long-term you know, contract vehicle. It's not so easy to respond uh, quickly, which by the way, we'll talk about, we've seen you know, in the pandemic play out. And we were like, too, maybe it's a pandemic. You know, like maybe it's, maybe it's a health reason that everyone needs to go home. And so we actually authored an article in 2018 in Harvard Business Review saying that remote work would be the key to business continuity in the face of a pandemic. And it was like almost a joke because we were like, <laughs> we were like, what's the high scale opportunity? We never obviously thought that would happen. So fast forward, this is January 2020. The company's just been acquired. I'm like, the world doesn't get it. I don't see a pandemic on the horizon. I don't see a financial downturn on the horizon. <laughs> Um, and I met the executive team at Deloitte. Um, they were going to acquire our company. They actually didn't, but it was a company that I met through the acquisition process. And I was like, you know what? I've done law. I've done startups. Let me go get a business view um, and kind of look cross-sector. Um, and so I landed at Deloitte, and I was like, I'll think about the future of work sort of like 10% of my time. Um, and I started at Deloitte on February 24th, 2020. And so, <laughs> very quickly, they were like, uh, can you like, get all of the executives in the Fortune 500 comfortable with the idea of returning, you know, moving outside of their offices? And it was interesting because at that time, so I, I became the person that was speaking to the kind of the C-suite um, to advise them on how to initiate uh, work from home orders. These were mandatory work from home orders that were happening at the time. And they, uh, you have to remember that I've been in conversation now with executives on this topic for like five or six years, and it was not the norm in 2019 to have Zoom as a default or video conferencing as a default in your calendar system. So we think we haven't come far, but like that's wild to think about. Um, and what executives wanted to know at that time is they wanted to spend a lot of time thinking about access to health and safety equipment and they wanted to make sure that people could be in and return to the office as soon as possible. So we spent a lot of time modeling, for instance, how you could get an entire workforce into an elevator with six foot distancing requirements. And also you have to remember like how much these things were changing at the time. And so then it was like, well, it will take six hours to get your workforce into the elevator with those distancing requirements <laughs> and six hours to exit them. So I think you're gonna have to think about work from home. Um, and the conversations that were happening that time, at that time with executives, once they accepted that the elevators were a non-starter, um, they talked a lot about one-way and two-way doors. And they were talking about, uh, they, they were committed. They wanted to figure out how to do this well. Um, but I've always been interested in research and data, and so I was figuring out how to measure the impact of these changes pretty quickly at a bunch of different Deloitte clients. 
And it was pretty clear that culturally and um, from a ways of working and technology standpoint, that people were lifting and shifting the office environment into an online environment, and that was much less effective. So there, you know, there's been some great studies. Microsoft is a company I always watch for great future of work research. And you know, we talked about at that time sort of the collaboration tax, where people were using meetings as a way to um, architect the spontaneity of the office, and um, they just haven't hadn't figured it out. And you know, let's, we'll, we'll talk about that because I totally disagree that that is the outcome. I believe that the way working in an internet first way is a vastly more effective and time saving and, and higher quality way of working. But that was the friction that we were experiencing. So people were kind of having a bad experience in many ways. They were also in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and so that was, a, that was a real friction point that I think a lot of people were feeling. About 10 months into that experience, I got um, scooped up by Facebook and became the first head of remote work there. So my um, job at that time was to create the talent policies that were kind of the promise of this uh, landscape where we said, okay, we're gonna commit to new ways of working. What should that look like from an HR perspective? And about a year and a quarter after that, I got scooped up by Atlassian. Um, and now um, Atlassian's really interesting as a model. I love working there. Uh, we are a collaboration software company that makes tools like uh, Jira and Confluence and Loom. And uh, what I love about that is that there's a business alignment to figuring this out. So, you know, we, we make the collaboration tools that support this reality. And so there's a different level of vision and commitment from our founders, I think, than many other companies. And that makes it a great place to experiment for me. Um, and in this role, I'm the head of Team Anywhere, which shifts the, um, the company to a distributed first way of operating. And uh, what that means is I'm the head of real estate. I oversee a research team that looks at kind of ways of working and the biggest challenges of distributed and how to architect solutions to those things. Um, I also work with a storytelling team because you know we could talk, we could make this conversation also just about change. Um, and change is super difficult to navigate. If you're not telling really good stories in a really concrete way, you can't get there. Um, so now you know that's how I spend my days and. That was a very kind <laughs> question that you gave, and I just gave you like the history of uh, this challenge. So, apologies for buying, no, being long-winded. <laughs> no apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Very few people I talk to uh, in looking into future of work have been doing it since prior to the pandemic. It seems yeah. like most people, most experts, saw it. Uh, you know, in a way that you, you know, thankfully you preempted. Many people are like, oh my gosh, it's a fire drill. Everyone's suddenly remote. How do we manage it? So it's always good to hear about how you know perspectives have shifted since you were originally doing this work, and even for a period of time thought it would never really catch on. Right. Right. Um, so before we go further, just some level setting. We want to understand who's in the room today. This is a huge packed room we're thrilled about. Um, everyone here is probably in different industries, but raise your hand if you're in the office five days a week. Look at that. It's probably 10% of the room. We'll give you some good talking points today. Yeah. To your <laughs> Who here has an hour long commute to their office? Oh my gosh. Uh, and how many of you work remotely some of the time? Wow. And how many work remotely all the time? Whoa. What do you make of that? It seems about right. It's always been a normal curve, which is sort of like when you either look at access or need, it's sort of like 10% on one side and 10% on the other side and everybody else is the bell mm -hmm. curve in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the future of work is about choice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, my hypothesis and thesis is that it's not effective to regulate the daily working location of employees, right. um, either as a business process or as an outcome. And we can talk more in detail about that. Right. Uh, but I think it'll always be a normal curve, if that, even if that becomes the case, mm -hmm. because people should be able to self-select into what makes sense for them. Definitely. And you talk a lot about choice. You talk a lot about just giving people the autonomy to do what works best for them, yeah. uh, in even the, which hours work best for them, what location. Um, there is a lot of terminology that gets thrown around, uh, particularly uh, as different companies have enacted their plans, updated them, put different mandates in place. Atlassian, where you work, refers to it as distributed work yeah. rather than hybrid or flexible work. Uh, and I want to ask you whether there are meaningful differences between each of those terms and why you landed on distributed? Yes, I love this question. And this is a question that I've been thinking about for a really long time. 
So back when I founded my startup in 2015, 16, I actually met with the woman who coined the phrase workplace flexibility. I was like, what does this, it's, it's the lawyer in me. I'm like, I can't understand what these words mean. And you can't really drive change unless you have clarity. And I also think a lot of these words have a, a lot of um, negative connotations with them. I mean, if you image search remote work and you see people laying in their bed, you know that it's a term that you shouldn't, <laughs> doesn't have business viability. Um, so to me, the terms remote and hybrid work describe where work happens. They basically describe uh, an employee's relationship to an office. And I think that's really deep because when we define what work means through the history of um, through the history of work as it's come to be in the modern times, so like 100 plus years, um, you could go longer than that. The office is synonymous with work. The office is a dependency for getting work done. I do not believe that the office is a dependency for getting work done any longer. I do believe that the, the hours that people have access to one another are a dependency because that's the uh, nature of good collaboration, but the office is not a dependency. So I wanted to make sure that we had a word that showed that, the, that we don't define what work looks like on the basis of our relationship to the office, because that's not the future. So instead, we use the term distributed, which to me is a term that describes how work gets done. And to me, the idea that work happens on the internet is non-controversial. Mm -hmm. This has been the case for many years. However, there was a time where technology was developing and internet-based tools were developing, and the office remained a dependency because it was important. You still needed to kind of like be um, in the office to know people, to get work done, to um, be able to share information. That's just no longer the case. Mm -hmm. So I think distributed work is a much better term that captures the idea that this is just the next wave of digital transformation. It's an internet native way of getting work done. And that makes the office a nice to have, an awesome thing to have, and a really important tool in our enterprise or SMB you know, toolkit. Um, but it's not a dependency on how work gets done. And that's how we think about distributed. 100%. And uh, it's, I, I've spoken to you about this in the past uh, in interviews for Fortune, but just generally listening to you on panels, it's just, it seems fairly obvious that this is ultimately going to be the way that most companies function, just yeah. as a retention tool, if nothing else. Yeah. But obviously, there are tension points, and people have a lot of feelings about this debate. A lot of companies are a lot less open to it. A lot of industries like law and banking are a lot more resistant to changing the way a work has always been done, so they say, and so they want to keep it that way. Yeah. So when you think about the pro office cohort, the people who say five days a week, everyone back in, it doesn't matter where you live or what you've been doing, this is how we're doing it. Um, you know, what's one thing that they might get right or what they're really clinging to as evidence for why they're uh, approaching it that way? So if you think, it's interesting, we interviewed about, we interviewed some large number of Fortune 500 executives. It, it's in the hundreds, there's not that many Fortune 500 executives. And we asked them, will um, the world be more or less distributed in 10 years? And 98% of them said, the world would be more distributed. So again, like the fact that work is basically happening on the internet is non-controversial. However, it's a change, right? So if, um, and so I think that executives who are thinking about mandating office attendance think that they're doing something good for work outcomes, or they think that they are making a better case to their board about their real estate line item. And I'm the head of real estate. I know how much money it costs. It's not a small amount of money, right? Um, and so having people come to the office is a way to justify that line item. But let's put that aside. Let's pretend that's not the issue. We know what the challenges of work are today. People don't have enough focus time. 72% of meetings don't meet their intended outcome. 50% uh, of people are working more hours than, they're working beyond the workday because meetings prevent them from being able to get their work done during the working day. People are not clear on goals. Um, and, you know, those are the real challenges of work. And I think the executives that are saying, hey, let's head back to the office, think that they're going to impact those outcomes by having people in the office. Because the office has always been a way to organically share information and build culture and make relationships. But now there's a better way to do it than just being organic. Mm -hmm. You can actually design and control for these outcomes. Well, you also have the benefit of people showing to up to the office and having a great place to be and a great place to work if they need a place to work and 
a way to connect with, you know, and make work friends and a way to experience company loyalty. The office is valuable for sure. Right. It's just not a dependency on getting work done. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that when going back to what I initially said, this is a long term change. The, the office is a backstop right now. Mm -hmm. Like you can still, you know, before we figure out exactly those intentional internet first ways where it's just normalized and everyone is doing this, the office still does support that organic creation. It's not that effective because only 19% of teams are actually co-located today. So Microsoft did a great study. They found that um, 65 or so percent of their teams were what we were, would call co-located prior to the pandemic, meaning that they all are based within one office location. And now that's down to 25%. So like teams are not actually in the same office. That's actually a fallacy. Um, but you know, in the short term, it's a backstop. I think the reality is, are we committing to transformation and are we figuring out the better path forward? Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I would love to talk about is why that's good for business mm -hmm. and, and what those businesses are. Totally. What business values are. 100%. I think even among people who really advocate for remote work on some, in some capacity <laughs> would say the office has incredible value. And, you know, working at Atlassian, they have a Bay Area office. They have one here in Austin. They have one in New York, in Australia, in Europe. Yeah. Um, so what actually makes people want to come into offices like Atlassian's? And, you know, what also things like ping pong tables or concert, like what has the value in terms of uh, bringing people in and what is ultimately just for show? Yeah. So we had to really think about this. If, if the office is no longer a dependency to get work done, which maybe sounds a little academic, then what is the purpose of an office? And we say that there are three things that the office should achieve for a company. Um, the ability to, what we say, get shit done. So uh, if you are young in New York, which I was and maybe can no longer describe myself as young. Um, I certainly did not have enough room in my studio apartment or my like w apartment with four roommates when I was in law school to you know get work done in a professional way, um, and so we want to make sure that the office is available for people for that purpose. And by the way, when we look at young people, everyone's like, "Oh my God, the youth! They know how to use the internet." Number one, and number two, they actually go to the office more frequently than anyone else, and they self-select into living near the office more frequently than anyone else. Choice is a model that actually works. You can actually trust people to make decisions that are effective for them to make. So that's one, one piece. The second is company loyalty. So um, I think that there are a lot of companies out there that are like, we're remote first. And they think, again, they're, they're trying to describe their experience in relationship to an office. Mm -hmm. And I don't endorse that. I think the office is a very important tool. Um, and so some of these remote companies are saying, we don't need any offices. We're just going to meet in a random conference room from time to time. And that's actually very capital efficient, especially if you're a scaling company. So let's talk about that. Um, but there is no replacement for stepping into a physical environment that speaks to the values and vibe of your company and helping your employees see themselves as part of a community that's bigger than them. Um, and so an office is really important for that. So mm -hmm. getting shit done, company loyalty. Um, the third thing is about connection. So the opportunity for people to be connected to one another. We know that teams are not co-located and the most important connections that you have and make are actually with your teams that you do work with. So we have to think about how to architect that outcome. Um, but it's also great for people to have work friends. You know, um, people say, people talk about weak ties and the development of an organizational network, I actually haven't seen any legitimate research that speaks to the level of connections that are necessary to drive an effective company-wide network. I still think that's an open question. So anybody who says that it has to be the way it used to be, I, I don't buy into yet. Um, but it is really important for connection. And, and one way that we use and achieve that at Atlassian is through something called intentional togetherness. And that's basically an on-site program. We host about 1,600 of these a quarter. We have an employee base of about 12,000 people. And although our official policy is that you can choose where you live within certain time zone constraints, you can choose where you work every day uh, completely up to you. It can be at the, in your living room, the cafe, the office, wherever you want it to be. Um, 
but we architect connection through about four times a year, people coming together for three to five times, three to five days at a time in an offsite scenario, really focused on building social bonds, as well as doing that work that you just want to turn the timer off for and just go deep on and you know, let your creativity or complexity flow. And when we looked at the impact of that program, we found that intentional togetherness, so coming together for three to five days, grew team connection, so the people that you work with, by 27%. And the connection did not decay for four to five months. So it's a, it's a connection value that remains over periods of months. So, so you don't need to do it all the time. Then we also looked at people who sporadically attended the office because our people are attending the office all, you know, in a very you know, kind of unpredictable way whenever it works for them. Um, and we found that that did not have any impact on team connection. So you want to, again, it's like that, it, that might have an impact on company loyalty. It might have an impact on your ability to get work done day to day. But it doesn't have an impact on team connection. So again, I think a lot of driving and architecting change in this space is a lot of times about people saying, you have to do this. This is the thing I'm trying to solve. And it's like, but what are you really trying to solve? Are you trying to solve for team connection? Let's, or are you trying to solve for office attendance? Mm. Office attendance is not an outcome in and of itself. What would, the, what would the desired outcome of office attendance be? So like, that's how we have to kind of segment and validate these problems and then study them to see if our solutions work. Because it is designing a new way of operating an organization, mm -hmm. right? And should we talk about like what the value of that is? Right, and yeah. you know, there's uh, lots of buzzwords have popped up over the past couple of years, but resenteeism and presenteeism mm. are things that come up a lot, and I get a lot of da study data sent to me regarding those things about how, when it comes down to it, for a lot of bosses who haven't been intentional about their return to office plans or their mandates, just really rely on seeing the people that they manage physically at their desks with Microsoft Word open, as opposed to trusting that if it's at 1 p.m. and they just their little window on Teams isn't green, yeah. that how can they trust they're getting work done? Like with a lack of managerial acumen for a distributed team, they rely on or fall back on, I just want my people where I can see them. Right, and that's normal, right? Because people, the people who are kind of at your VP plus level in our global corporate environment have built careers managing that way. Right. And so I think we have to have a lot of empathy for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the challenge is creating the space to do it differently mm -hmm. um, because we don't see that there is a correlation between presenteeism and getting your job done. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that we need to define goals in a new way. Um, I think every company should have a really strong performance management process, and I think every company should have a very strong goal setting process. Um, because one of the big challenges in this environment is clarity. Right. Um, but when you have clarity and you put it in an internet-based environment, meaning that it's in a system, it's, um, you know, in, you can track it online. Anyone at your company can figure out how to do, how to get the information they need and know what they need to work on um, without having a meeting to facilitate that. Right. So again, when we think of, um, when we think of the office as not a dependency to get work done, mm -hmm. we also should think about meetings are not a dependency to share information. Meetings are not a dependency to create clarity. What meetings should be for is either to like solve a big problem together, to unblock a question. Um, and I do think that your day should be full of meetings in a way, like right. up to 50%. But in those meetings, you're not talking about work, you're doing work together. Right. And that is a very different way of doing things right. and a more effective way of doing things. Always. A good balance and you know, having to do things that require collaboration with the people, either face-to-face -face or on Zoom, or just individual busy work. Yeah. It's all, there's a balance there for sure. Um, but as we're talking about these different solutions, different distributed work plans, um, I'm curious about, as it pertains to learning and getting a feel for what it's like to be at a company, to be an adult, I'm thinking about people who are, are on the younger side, people who might have been in undergrad when COVID hit yeah. and they, their internships went remote or they never got the chance to come and be on the morning commute and be in an office. Um, and when it comes to allowing for people to do what's comfortable for them, I wonder whether for younger people they might tend towards staying home out of fear, out of intimidation, out of not being sure what the norms are and feeling a little bit misplaced. And I'm curious what your view is of how to support the 22-year-old, the fresh out of college person who needs to learn how to do the job and whether there should be different expectations or in-office requirements for new workforce entrants like them. This is such a big topic. 
Um, and I hate talking about young people without them in the room. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I think we should really be facilitating this conversation with people who are 18 and 20 and hear their experience about being in college in the pandemic and, right. and talk to them. Um, so at Atlassian, we did do a research project. We um, looked at what leadership's perspective of what young people need to be successful in the environment, in this environment. And we also talked to the early career folks themselves um, to understand what their perceptions and needs were. Now, like, you know, people who are one year out of college don't necessarily know what they don't know, but we were looking for the gaps in the experience and expectations. And um, I would say that we kind of realized that they needed a couple of things. On the one hand, they needed access to their manager and that they needed a low friction way to get questions answered and they needed a real relationship with their manager. Um, they needed low key kind of ways to sort of organically learn what is normal. And by the way, I think they can help us understand what's normal in this world. I don't think that we need to just tell them. So I hope that can be a two way or multi way exchange. And then they need skill development. They need to actually learn the craft of their career. Um, and it used to be that the office was a dependency to give people the access to craft in their career because you kind of, it was an organic over the shoulder way. Should it be organic and unplanned to have people learn about their career? I'm not sure that's the best way to do it, right? So we kind of are experimenting in a couple of different ways. Um, one is that we are creating high quality in-person experiences for new, you know, early career folks. Um, onboarding in person, for instance, um, over like a two to three week period. And that gives them some of the organic good juju of kind of setting expectations and seeing what the company is like. Um, and it's also really high quality, so it doesn't feel arbitrary that we're asking them to be there. Mm -hmm. um, then we're developing very specific learning programs, mm -hmm. which is not a small lift. You know, I don't, I don't think that, I'm not pretending that that happens overnight. Um, but we want to make sure that they're in a learning program and we can see their progress over time. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that's interesting, and we haven't spoken a lot about locations, but um, I guess answer first is that uh, if you're early career, so if you're the first two years out of college, you need about eight hours of overlap with your manager. So you need the, the time zone overlap of a full working day with your manager. Um, and the way that we think about that is we look at the globe as a flat map and we draw six vertical stripes on that map that are roughly the same size that represent kind of different zones. And sometimes I call them stripes or sometimes we call them collaboration zones. And if you take two stripes that are next to each other, then that by default means that there's four hours of working hour overlap in those two stripes by default. So in general, if you're an average team member, most team members, as long as you constrain the team horizontally on that map, to two stripes, then they have the right default working conditions of four hours of overlap. If you expand it to three stripes, then you have, you know, maybe like two to three hours. By the way, like what is a time zone if somebody can actually explain it to me uh, after doing so much research on time zones? Um, so it kind of vary, it varies. It's not a fixed thing. It varies by the, where the sun is and people's different geopolitical relationship to the length of the working day. Um, but if you extend to three stripes, then you kind of have two hours across that zone. And that can be OK for your kind of VP level population, managing your director level population and anyone who's more senior than that. Mm -hmm. But if you are in your early career, then you want to be in one stripe. Um, it might also be if you are servicing customers, you want to have that full working day overlap. So they, you want to keep them all to one stripe. Right. Um, and that gives the eight hours of you know, working hours overlap. That is really important to mm -hmm. removing the friction for getting questions answered. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing some things around you know, uh, momentum and accountability. Um, and it can be you know, a lot of the research that's looked at impact, negative impact of productivity and uh, remote work, which is now, by the way, been, there was a study that came out to say that it was 10 to 20% less effective and actually uh, the academics have now reversed that statement. Mm -hmm. But they were looking at really highly independent tasks like call center tasks, and that can be really boring when you're alone. So your motivation can decrease. So if you have a group of people that are working in a distributed way and they're working in a um, non-communal environment, you can create that communal environment virtually. Mm -hmm. We don't know the exact impact of that yet, but um, it's like I've actually been hearing about freelance creatives 
sign into this platform where they just hold us, each other accountable. They're like, we're doing creative work right now. And so they sit there for three to four hours um, and they are present for one another to do that. Um, we call it virtual co-working. So it might be that um, you, you as a manager are in a virtual co-working setting with two or three of your direct reports or, or relevant teammates. And that just keeps the, the environment communal um, in a way and it makes it very low friction to ask mm -hmm. questions. So that could be a really useful tool for the early career population. Um, we've not fully studied it yet, but I have a hypothesis that it will be effective. 100%, and also it's these questions that, you know, even I'm the one asking them, it kind of disregards how already, long before COVID, people in the same time zones worked in totally different ways. Yeah. I think pre-COVID about a boss I had who had young kids and would routinely work from 4.30 to 7.30 before his kids woke up and then right. give me notes that I would read when the day started. Totally. And that's not that meaningfully different from somebody who works totally opposite hours. Right. It's just a matter of what worked for him and then I would receive it and it had nothing to do with where we were. So it's almost as though today that would be like, well, how do we manage for this? Like, when are they going to be together? What time should this or that? Uh, and another thing, uh, when I talked to a real estate professional a few months ago, pointed out to me that, because, you know, we report on, uh, there are tons of uh, metrics now about office occupancy on a week by week right. basis, which days are most popular, which days no one's there. Uh, and something that a chairman of a real estate firm told me was that we tend to forget in a typical work day in 2017, executives were out meeting with clients. They were on right. business trips. They were working from a client site or whatever. It was never everyone was at their desks all the time. And since uh, the vaccines were rolled out, the thinking in a lot of places was we have to get back to the way things were. But I think what the thread that gets lost is it never really was the way that some people totally. envision it. Totally. Um, and I'm interested in what you brought up a second ago, just about productivity. That's yeah. a real sticking point, is a lot of really intransigent bosses who say, if you're not sitting at a desk working on the gun at 9 a.m., you're just not getting work done in the way that we need, or yeah. in the way that we're used to, or the way that the business needs to function. Um, what do you say to that? What do you say to the thought that if you're at home, uh, maybe even some people better than others, but what's, what's the argument about productivity look like from where you're sitting right now? Yeah. It's funny, I've been in OKR planning, so we've been like talking about goal setting and how to define a goal. Um, and, you know, productivity is a, not a effective outcome measure mm -hmm. in a knowledge work environment. Um, but we do, and, and that word becomes difficult and almost weaponized because you right. can't really effectively measure it. So the reason I make the joke about goal setting, we're like, okay, if your goal is to lose weight, it's like, I want my target weight to be X, Y, Z. And then you look at the levers of how to achieve that. You're like, okay, I'm gonna optimize for diet. I'm gonna optimize for exercise. And when you think about what people mean by productivity, we have to really think about what are the component parts of a distributed environment and how you can harness it to be even more productive than mm -hmm. we were before. Um, so how do you make it really easy for people to access information? How do you make communication much more streamlined? Mm -hmm. How do you um, save people time, mm -hmm. you know, um, and allow them to spend time then working on the things that right. really matter? Right. So um, I don't think that there is a perfect measure of productivity. The people who are studying productivity um, as an outcome in this environment are finding that it's, there's not a loss of productivity, and actually the economists, the economists say that even, if, even in that environment where they're studying the um, small independent tasks, and there is a cost because people kind of like lose motivation in these isolated environments, um, they're like, even if it's 10% less productive in, on that task value, the, fa the fact is that you're accruing different, val different kinds right. of value to the business that so far outweigh that loss that like it's silly that we're even talking about that. Um, and when I look at that from an enter, just to go there for a minute, when I look at that from an enterprise level, why should companies do this? You know, um, and because not everyone is thinking about this in, you know, there's a lot of, I guess, easy ways. There's a lot of boardrooms that people are in where they, they just kind of are like, well, the past is effective, so let's not set a burden of proof to do it differently. Let's only set a burden of proof for thinking about doing things in a new way. And I do think that's just like the concept of loss aversion and change that is a big, really at play here. Um, and it's human nature, so I have a lot of empathy for it. Um, but of course, we're being disruptive, disrupted left, right, and center. So right. you know, companies that do get good at doing things differently, I think, are going to have an unnatural advantage. However, okay, let's just talk about distributed work. Distributed work being the concept that work primarily happens online 
and that you don't need to actually control people's day-to-day -day working location, but you do assume that people are going to stay connected and that they have enough to working hours overlap to have ideal collaboration conditions. So I'm talking about a good distributed environment. What's the value? The first is talent. Mm -hmm. So it's talent access, talent retention, DEI, engagement, and sort of sustainability. Um, and what I mean by that, or the evidence that we've put together on this at Atlassian, I love having a company like Atlassian that we can work with and kind of quantify these things because a lot of companies aren't doing this. Um, we are getting two times the number of job applicants for every job. We are hiring each, we're filling each role 20% faster. We have doubled the representation of women in India. We have our regrettable attrition for women is down by 43%. Our representation of women in tech has doubled. It is wild. This is not, this is a non-controversial change that simply reflects the way the world operates today. And it is so attractive to people that the things that we have been spending uh, banging our head against the wall in HR departments for the past 15 years are solvable in a quarter. It's crazy to me that we are not all embracing this equally. Um, <laughs> Truly. And um, the, so that's talent access, DEI representation. You can get more people faster. You can uh, get the right people to the table, and you're losing people at a lower rate. Um, then you want to talk about efficiency. So this really matters to me. Sometimes people like, don't want me to talk about efficiency and saving money, but I've been influencing the C-suite on this topic for a decade now, and it matters, right? So we've got to figure out how, whether this is a more efficient model. And what we're seeing is that we are spending 50% less money. Uh, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't quantify it on dollars. We expect that our, 50, that our footprint for real estate will be 50% smaller going forward than it would have been in the environment where one additional headcount equals 150 square feet additional real estate. So it used to be that your, um, your real estate trend line was a straight up into the right growth trend line alongside your headcount. It was just kind of a, an additional cost layer of adding a new employee. That's no longer the case because we operate dynamic offices that are driven by hospitality. You can also, in that model where I was talking about kind of my stripes, and uh, I talk about horizontal sprawl, so I don't want teams to go to sprawl too horizontally. I want them to stay horizontally constrained. But then there's a lot of different countries and regions and locations vertically. And so you can diversify your talent cost in a really unique way and not uh, have the collaboration impact because the outsourcing model of the past 25 years has been a, you know, attain talent at a lower cost, but there's a collaboration cost because like the hours are reversed or you require people to work on a different hours. So you can actually have a more mature location model that gives you access to undiluted collaboration plus cost diversification. So those are two really strong indicators that this is a more efficient way of operating. Um, the last thing is that I also think it's a more effective way of operating. Because in the, uh, in the world where we were using the office as a way to get work done, um, and we were kind of organically letting culture unfold, organically letting connections unfold, and most importantly, organically sharing information, and organically assigning goals and creating clarity, there is a world where all of that becomes part of what we call the async infrastructure. And um, if you can get async infrastructure right, that means that everyone should have access to information at any time, no matter what time they're working at. They don't need a meeting to get information that they need to get work done. They can make things very clear to their teams. Um, you can have your manager, so Loom is one of our tools, it's a video tool, I just recorded a Loom before I walked in this room. Um, and it is a really cool socially enabled video tool where you record a, um, a video of yourself and in this case, I, I was actually doing an all company announcement on this Loom. And um, it's very socially enabled, so like if, you know, at mid, uh, at second 27, people could respond to exactly what I'm saying at that time, and I can respond to them later, or they can indicate that they like or dislike what I'm saying um, with an emoji. So it's a very kind of uh, native, natively social um, way of doing things. But what's great about it is you can watch that video as the audience member at 1.5 speed, at 1.7 speed. You can control it. You can repeat the thing that you might want to hear again. You can skip forward the things that you don't need to hear. Um, 
And we studied Loom and found that um, we have, managers are able to build better connections with their team, even without additional time spent. So they don't need a meeting to build that connection. They can use tools like Loom um, to you know, make that happen. So what I was talking about as a value area is this idea of working differently. Um, and people talk about async. I actually think the promise of async is creativity. Because when we think about AI and we think about using these systems to get information into a natively online format and saving people time because they don't need meetings to get access to information, then all of a sudden your day frees up. And you can actually use the day not to administrate work, not to be an administrator or a bureaucrat of work, but an actual worker. And before, when I started this conversation, I said 50% of people can't get their work done in the workday mm. because they're too stuck in meetings. There's a way more effective way to share information than one-off meetings. So we have to figure out how to adopt those ways of working. And if you're a company that is forcing your employees back in the office five days a week, you have less short-term pain potentially because you, like I said, you kind of get that Band-Aid effect. Right. But you are actively holding yourself back from building the infrastructure that makes AI valuable that helps save your employees time. And ultimately, I think will unleash a, a new kind of creative work environment. And that's mm -hmm. what I really think the promise of this is. The last thing we could talk about is, of course, societal. Mm. And that's where things get really confusing. Because <laughs> when we work in this way, not only do we save time for companies and we, it's more efficient, we're getting more talent, and we're, getting, we're building more effective ways of operating, but the thing that dominates our attention is that it also feels better to people. And so because it feels better to people, and businesses tend to take the uh, antagonistic view that that's not real value. Mm. And so we don't, you know, we can't really engage in that conversation. The thing that I would really like to be able to do, and I'm working on this right now to try to find out, is I'd like to be able to quantify the value that accrues to people so that we can talk about it in a sophisticated way. Mm -hmm. For instance, I think the fact that a pregnant woman doesn't have to commute to an office, like I did throwing up in trash cans on subway platforms in high heels, like I think that accrues real value to people and families and local communities and to business. But it's just my personal story. That sucks that you had to throw up in the trash can on the, you know, on the subway platform. But it's real. And so, or the fact that you know, women have access to be able to breastfeed their children instead of pumping at work, which uh, by the way is a three hour cycle, and in every three hours, you have to spend one hour attending to that task. So like, you know, how can we talk about this in a way that um, really shows that there is a macro value in resolving these challenges and not just doing someone a personal favor? But right now, we're not talking about those three buckets of value enough. We're not talking about the business value. And we're allowing the whole conversation to be driven by one-off personal anecdotes. And that is you know, not an effective way to overcome the 100 year bias we have to the idea that work and the, and the office are inextricably linked, you know? Mm -hmm. Wow, so much to think about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as we're getting to the end here, we're gonna leave time for questions. So if anyone has questions for Annie on this topic, there is a microphone in the center aisle here. You can start lining up. Um, we'll leave time for those, but while everyone's getting together, um, I wanted to ask, as we you know, saw at the front, uh, at the start of the panel, a good number of people in here still work five days a week. Right. Even more people have an hour commute when they do go in. Um, if they're entrenched in companies that that's their values, are there ways that um, you know, people in those in-person jobs can still reap some benefits of distributed work? It's a great question. Um, I do think that facilitating a conversation with, so we know that um, behavior changes when you change 10% of a team's behavior. So just figuring out how to work differently, I think is a, actually a really great way to hack this. Because once you work differently, it's really addictive. I say it's like a drug. And so um, if you can start to get your team to work differently, you'll probably get attention in your company. And you might be able to start driving a conversation like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a lot of great research out there. We, we at Atlassian put out something called Lessons Learned, A Thousand Days of Distributed. And I think there's some really good research in there to just help executives think differently. Um, you can always message me or find me on LinkedIn, and I'll like send you a full bullet, few bullet points that you can send to your boss. Um, I love I love to hack it that way. Um, so you know, feel free to reach out to me that way. Awesome. Uh, yes, go ahead. First question. 
I find your work endlessly interesting. I could listen to you talk all day. And I'm very fortunate to work in a fully distributed company now. I have a lot of that privilege. But, uh, you know, I think our ways of working are maybe not as sophisticated or it's as data-driven uh, as you talk about in large part because our company lacks a role that's equivalent to yours. Yeah. So in that sense, like, we're kind of still stuck in, like, pandemic era working where it's like we're doing it, but are we doing it? the best that we possibly can. Yeah. So to evolve that, are there kinds of uh, distributed means of responsibility or kind of how do you say that we should maybe go about that when we don't have like a clear leader over distributed work? Yeah, and that's first of all so hard. This, is, this change is not well resourced at most companies. Um, and I think what you just said is something I really believe in, which is that uh, maintaining the office as kind of this way of being actually actively inhibits the graduation to a new way of working. And why shouldn't we all be working better? I mean, it could unlock huge productivity at the you know GDP level, like let's do it, please. Um, but I think a couple of things that you can start to play with. One, one of my favorite simplest tools is called Smart Brevity. It's by the founders of Axios. And it's the principle that any person who reads any communication from you only has 12 seconds. So it helps you really figure out how to communicate in a, different, in a way that's super outcome first. And then I think if there's one other principle that you can think about is um, how do I replace all my meetings with only meetings that are where I get work done? If there's any meeting that's a one-way conversation or is about information sharing or anything else, use that as the principle to start hacking your day uh, you know, differently. Um, at Atlassian, we did research where we showed that cap your meetings at 50% of the day and staple your meetings together. <coughs> so do like two hour blocks at a time and then spend the rest of your day on individual focus work or just like, oh, Jane and I are overlapping at this time and we can grab each other to collaborate spontaneously. And the whole, everything like opens up and it's so much more effective and people were declining meetings at a much higher rate um, even a month after we ran the experiment. So I feel like it's, it's hacking those ways of working that can actually yield influence and what you need to continue is influence to be able to say, and let's think about, you know, now that we're doing this so well, maybe we don't need to come into the office every day or, or maybe we can have a, um, 90 day work from anywhere policy, which we do, and I spend my summer at the beach as a result instead of in New York City. Um, does that answer your question? It, it does, and I'm a loom lover already, so <laughs> some of these things are like in practice, but it's helpful to hear them affirmed and to share them with others, so yeah, yeah thank you. Awesome, awesome. thank Thanks. you. Uh, yeah, up next. Hi, my name is Andrea. I love everything that you said. I share your, your point of view on everything. And one thing that I find it really hard is to help companies I mean, I, I own a platform about, co about content, about innovation, and we talk a lot about these things. And I think that HRs are interested in implementing certain uh, rules and some certain methods in their companies. But I find it really hard to um, find resources, courses about it, because I, yeah. I understand it's a whole new way of working. It's not just you know, adopting certain tools. Uh, it's a whole new way of working. Yeah. And there are not enough resources where people can, I mean, uh, learn yeah. so they can implement in their companies. Any ideas on where we can find, I mean, is there any course, any book or anything that can help people to bring this mentality, this mindset to their companies? I'm laughing because it like predominantly lives rent-free in my head, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that- it's, it's a business opportunity, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's really hard. I, well, okay, Cal Newport is writing a new book um, called Slow Productivity, and um, it talks about slow productivity. I actually think it's about moving way faster. I think his work really captures new ways of working in an interesting way, or at least talks really um, thoughtfully about the root causes. That's probably the only research that I'm really excited about. Um, I think that more stuff will start to come out um, I do think that there are kind of a set of four principles that companies need to do this. One is cultural adoption and endorsement, so actively working against the idea of proximity bias um, or the idea that office equals work. Um, two is maturing their location philosophy. So that means, oh, you know, I used to work with a team of 150 people to manage the daily working location of people from a compliance perspective. That is a hugely wasteful business process. Yeah. 
We, you know, so we have to update our location models. By the way, laws will have to update too. Um, we have to have a, a, an approach to connection. So you, you have to make sure your people are connected. Um, and we have to utilize our offices for the right outcomes. And then we have to start architecting new ways of working. So those, you know, I think we have to invite ourselves to the table. We're discovering the future as we experience yeah. it. And I think if people can start thinking of those things as challenge areas, then we can resource and discover and create resources together. I am always working on getting out clear information on this and making it all exportable. So you know, you'll know, you hopefully see more from me and I'm always talking about this on LinkedIn. And interestingly, we're always testing on LinkedIn to see what people understand and, are, and gravitate to. So um, those might seem like baked messages or ideas, but actually we're looking to all of you to see how you engage with them. Um, so that's another place where we're learning. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Up next. Hello, um, I'm Matt, I'm in workforce development, and I was just curious if you could maybe expand on your learning pathways that you're creating. We are doing something similar because we've identified skills gaps that we're trying to bridge, especially with entry level uh, college yeah. junior employees in software engineering and development. Uh, baseline knowledge is there, but being able to get them to do the actual work that we need to do. So I was just curious if you're using a platform, if you're working with, you know, uh, content SMEs in your company, what is the purpose? Is it out of necessity or just helping for assimilation to work expectations, things like that? Yeah, it's interesting because even the process of doing it is hard. So yeah. making, you know, making sure that we have a strategy where we're saying our, our strategy outcomes for this learning are X, Y, and Z, and our content is going to be developed for the strategy. Because I don't know if you see this, but sometimes I feel like we're like, ah, we need learning content, so we just make content. And we want to make sure that the content that we develop actually is measurable at driving the learning outcomes over time. It's not super easy. Um, and I think a lot of times this stuff starts to kill me because you know it's like it's hard for me to be able to get into the depth of every business unit area and understand what the problems and challenges are in a unique and local way. Um, so you have to engage senior level engineers and they're really busy. Right, so it's like you have to like pull it out of people in a, um, a really thoughtful, kind of like well-executed way. You're smiling, because it's like, yeah, this is my day-to-day -day life and I'm dying over this. <laughs> no answers for you, good luck. Send me, send me, tell me how it goes on LinkedIn, I appreciate it. Hello, my name is Umberto. Thanks to both of you for the great talk. Uh, I'm interested in the topic of discipline working from home yeah. because I've done some research and I'm talking to some people and this topic grows. Uh, does the c companies should formally help the, the employees in that topic or just let be something informal? What is your perception about the topic? It's interesting. So it, it, as I understand it, the question is kind of like, how do you maintain momentum and be really disciplined? And if you're working by yourself, un, kind of unsupervised, how do you make sure that we're still getting outcomes? Yeah, out of how, how, how companies support the, the employees or should they support the employees formally providing training programs? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, and I think, I think it's real that, you know, as you get, as, when you're working alone and you might not be connected to people that, you know, you have to be thoughtful about how to continue to build momentum. Um, and I think it's um, one thing that we have found really effective is helping people know what they need to do. So we have a ritual on my team where on, mon on our Monday team meeting, everybody fills in a document and we, we do all meetings through documentation. So we start our meeting with usually a page read that's three to four minutes. Um, and it means that everyone gets on the same page instead in three minutes of reading as opposed to 17 minutes of conversation. So a 30 minute unit of time is way more effective. Um, and we all write our top three objectives for that week and we rate our top three objectives from the previous week as red, yellow, or green so that you can see the trend line of like, oh, this particular work stream is just not advancing. Um, and then we say, is your, day, is your week actually designed to achieve this outcome? And that actually is a big unlock for people where they go and design their time for the purpose of achieving the objective. Because I think a lot of people enter their day and they're like, my purpose is to show up and do all the things that my calendar says that I should do. But like, your calendar is not in control of you. You can do something differently, right? So to break that mindset. And we studied when people knew what they, when they asked themselves every single day, what's the one thing I must do today in order to get to my weekly objectives, they actually maintain that momentum, they work much faster, they unblock issues faster. So I think it's less about 
formal training and, um, and supervision and more about building the rituals that help drive clarity because having the clarity, by the way, the people who know what they're supposed to do, they also report being mildly more stressed, which is like a healthy stress. They know that they've got to do something as opposed to just kind of showing up and let their calendar tell them what to do. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, all right, we'll do one more, one more. Let's do it, okay. <laughs> we'll chat afterwards, yes. So hi, ahead. Annie, hi, Jane. Thank you so much for having this conversation. Um, I am a software engineer, DevOps specifically, and I really leverage a lot of the tools and the research that Atlassian has out on developer experience, developer productivity, developer wellness. So um, this was really interesting to me. My question is, um, I've been working uh, remotely for about a year now, and a good portion of my team is remote, but the mm -hmm. other half, I would say, are still in office. Yeah. Um, and I can sometimes feel myself throughout this year, like losing social capital as the people in office grow closer and I'm like further away. And so I'm wondering if there's any advice you have for like someone in my position who is still looking to maneuver in their career yeah. um, and like build those, those connections or build someone who's gonna be advocating for me to get the promotion and, and things of that nature. That's a great yeah, question. That's a great question. I'm so happy that you shared that experience. I'm probably gonna quote that like now in like five different stories. <laughs> so you can see it show up on LinkedIn and be like, <laughs> um, I unfortunately I think this is real, right? Mm -hmm. Like that like I said, the change is long term. And mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the like we were talking about what do the companies need to do if you want to do this well and really step into the future cultural adoption and pushing against the ideas of proximity bias have to be top of mind. Mm -hmm. Sound like they aren't at your company. Right. Um, and what I would do is, how far do you live from the office? Is it a plane ride? Eight hours. <laughs> Eight hours, yeah. I would make, I would get sponsorship to go to the office for a week, a quarter, mm -hmm. and I would um, go do it relatively soon, especially if you feel like a, you know, you're losing social capital um, or that it's like on a downward trend line and just go spend time with them um, and work alongside them and you know, organize dinners with people or whatever you need to do. And that, like we said in the research, that should actually keep your social capital high for like a few, diff a few months. Right. Um, but I do think that it's the richness of you know, even seeing people in 3D that you've only seen online. Yeah. You can pick up somebody's energy in a totally different way. In person does matter. It's mm -hmm. not irrelevant part of this. Right. Um, and it's unfortunate when we create these two-tier systems, that's something mm -hmm. we really have to fight against. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're kind of in the two-tier system on the bottom mm -hmm. tier. Yeah. So like, go show up and make sure that you're on the top tier. You know. I will. Thank you so much. <laughs> of that's course. all good. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you guys. <laughs>